Oh my gosh, folks, get your shanties ready. I mean, didn't everybody love the sea shanty that CA released whenever we heard about the Vampire Coast? Yeah, it was crazy. Everybody was like mostly like really into the song. In fact, I think CA put a video up that was just the song and people were like sitting there listening to it. Yeah, so the Vampire Coast is the final faction that we're going to be covering in the State of the Faction series. So a little bit sad and a little bit exciting here that I will have completed the series and we will talk through them here as the final faction that we got for Total War Warhammer 2. Um, so we've been looking at all these factions. Are they ready for game three? Well, let's think about the coast here. The coast was an interesting one for me. They didn't really have a fully fleshed out roster for Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Yeah, some of the stuff was mentioned. It was talked about in some of the books and the lore from what I was told. I think I even got together with Loremaster Sotek on this one whenever they came out and he filled me in on some of the details. It was really interesting. And th what this was though, even whether, whether we realized it or not at the time, was this was an opening to a whole new realm here, meaning that obviously Games Workshop was so happy with what Creative Assembly was doing with Total War Warhammer that they were willing to let CA work with them to basically create factions that didn't fully exist in Total War, uh, War or in fantasy battles for, for Warhammer. And so that was pretty exciting. And it honestly opened the door and, in my opinion, led the way to what we see in Warhammer 3 with Kislev and Cathay. And then in my, again, my opinion, I have no idea what's going to happen in the future, but we could very well see End and Nippon, Araby and all these other things. And I think Araby actually had a roster. But what, all I'm getting at is that this, this opens a totally new door. And the coast were the beginning of it. And they brought some really unique stuff because, again, you didn't know everything that was going to come. We got the, a faction that played like undead on the map, but had guns and a little bit of skirmishing capability, which was totally different than the counts. Um, and then you also mix that with the fact that on the campaign map, they play kind of like a nomadic faction, but also like a faction that can settle. And that was unique. And then they sail around looking for infamy, taking out other pirates, looking for treasure. And it just creates this really awesome thematic gameplay. Everything in Warhammer is loosely based off something from history, basically, anyway. And the coast obviously gives us that fun Pirates of the Caribbean feel um, that they're loosely based on. And it, it's a really good time. So I'm excited to cover the Vampire um, Coast. They were a cool final addition into the game. They brought a lot of unique mechanics, units, play style, all that kind of stuff. So let's dive right in and take a look at the Vampire Coast. A vampire coast. Let's jump in and start looking at the locations in which each lord starts their campaign and see if those are unique. We'll see whether the lords are in vortex and then we will start loading up each lord's mortal empires campaign start one by one to ensure that we have unique play style and mechanics and everything else. So let's take a look here um, at the first lord, which is Luther Harkon, the crazy himself. And he starts in the northeastern coast of Lustria and is immediately going to be fighting with Lizardmen. You can see that he uh, is not going to be doing well with Lizardmen in terms of <laughs> diplomacy. And that's no big surprise. Um, and Luther is an interesting lord. Like I said, we'll see him up close and we'll cover his roster. But nice start position for him with a whole lot of conflict around. Count Noctilus gets the easier start position, but it's a fun one even though it's a bit easier because you can kind of choose where he's going to go to. Is he going to go raid Ulthuan? Is he going to go to Astalia? Is he going to go into Lustria? Does he go uh, south and east to the uh, Southlands, fight against the Tomb Kings and Bretonians? So lots of options for Count Noctilus, plus a relatively safe start position, which makes him a good pick if someone is wanting to try their first Vampire Coast campaign, plus a pretty unique Lord in general. Um, I mean, again, we'll cover it later, but him having the Necrofex Colossus mount is pretty awesome. And we get RNS Assault Spite, who isn't quite a vampire herself, though she is missing several limbs, um, which have been replaced with various parts from Saw Sharks. Um, but Aranessa actually kind of has a unique feel because she mixes some living troops with the undead troops. She starts off the, uh, the coast of Tylea and Astalia, um, gives her an interesting spot to start raiding into the old world and it is quite a bit of fun, so another nice start position. And then we get Silostra Direfin, um, the ghostly lady um, of whom it is not over until she sings in a battle. And here we have her start at the uh, just alpha of the Sea of Serpents in the southern jungle of Po... po blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, that place. So she starts near Mazda Mundi. There are some Norskins around. There are Druki about. Um, it is a hot start. Uh, for Silostra, so 
you better believe that you're going to be getting into it uh, early with Silostra. So it is fun stuff. So four unique starts in Mortal Empires. Let's jump over here to the Eye of the Vortex and see what we get for the coast, <coughs> the coast with the most. And they are still going to have unique starts. Um, Archon basically in the same spot. Noctilus in the same spot, albeit the Galleon's Graveyard is slightly shifted on the Vortex versus the Mortal Empires. Um, similar start for Aranessa. Um, however, she starts on Sartosa, and remember that this is the Vortex map, so she really can't go east, which means that she's kind of forced to go after Ulth 1 or the Southlands 1 uh, early off, but <clears throat> it gives her a relatively safe Citadel-type start because of being on an island. And then we've got Silostra, um, who starts in, again, roughly the same position, surrounded by Druki, Lizardmen, Empire Colonies, all kinds of stuff going on. So a pretty hot start uh, once again. So pretty unique starts. They're not like totally different like they were with the Skaven, um, but still pretty solid position in terms of uh, the starting locations for each of the Vampire Coast Lords. Let's start loading them up now and show you what is different about each one. All right, in the jungles of Lustria with Luther Hawkon, let's take a look at the unique campaign mechanics for the Vampire Coast that make them a fun play. So we'll start off up here with Infamy. You can see that um, as a pirate, you are, of course, going to want to be earning Infamy. This kind of reminds me of that old Sid Meier's Pirates game because there was a similar system there where you were trying to work your way to a list of the top of the pirates. The cool thing is, is that all these other pirates are sailing about and you can fight them and take that infamy from them, and it is really fun. Um, and you also can pick up these sea shanty verses, and you have to get these verses in order to get to a final battle um, against a monster. It's, it's really pretty cool what they have going on. So, I mean, if we look at the objectives here, victory conditions, um, restore Harkon's mind, and um, trying to grab this different stuff here. So I'm trying to remember if it's a uh, short can victory. Yeah, restore Harkon's mind. You have to restore his mind as part of it, and grabbing these shanty verses are an important part of that. You can see that it uh, has big buffs as you grab the shanty verses as well. Uh, makes your army significantly stronger in terms of uh, melee and uh, uh, reload skill. It's a it's a temporary buff, but a really good one nonetheless. Now the Vampire Coast does spread corruption, um, and they have a couple of pretty cool, interesting things here. Let's let's read through it so that it, we cover it properly. Pirate crews and shipbuilding. Um, it says enlist and expand your crew via pirate settlements, meaning like this at the Awakening. Um, your lord operates as a mobile fighting and construction platform independent from normal empire building and able to recruit and construct from their flagship at sea or on land without the need for a settlement. So what that does is it kind of makes the coast a combined nomadic and settling faction, which was pretty unique at the time. And so you can see here on the shipbuilding, you can build up Harkon's flagship or you can use um, the settlements to do it. So this is a really fun mechanic with the coast, and it means that they can get all over the map, keep fighting, keep recruiting, and it makes them very unique and very fun. And then you combine that with the infamy thing where you're trying to hunt down these pirates, and it is it is a good time, which we just talked infamy, by the way, but let's read through it just to make sure we cover everything. It says, to become a legendary pirate, you must first acquire infamy through your actions, defeating armies, capturing settlements, establishing pirate coves, which we'll talk about shortly, um, will increase infamy levels. In doing so, your ranking on the list of infamous pilots will uh, improve, rising towards the top and drawing the attention of legendary pirates in possession of the power soul versus the lost sea shanty. So you need to improve to draw those guys in and then defeat them. Now, pirate coves are kind of like a Skaven undercity, and you can establish these pirate coves with your agent. Um, so you go to an enemy port settlement, you establish this pirate cove, and you can start trade and other things through them. They actually got nerfed because they were so strong um, by CA, but it's still a really cool thing. So the, the Vampire Coast was kind of this cool combination of nomadic and settling. They got a little bit of the Undercity stuff from the Skaven, and they then brought the Undead mechanic from the Vampire Counts, but kind of mixed it with some of the defensive um, shooting play style like you get from the Dwarves. But then they also mixed it where they got in some large monstrous units and um, artillery and magic. So it's kind of like a it's, it's a hybrid. They get a ton of different stuff. It makes them a very interesting faction, a very fun play style. But anyway, you can see here if we go to the treasure map, um, uh, you can if you pick up treasure maps, you can kind of use them to find your way. And then there's pieces of eight which unlock unique stuff here as well. So this is another bit of uniqueness um, that the Vampire Coast gets. You can go hunt down these treasures and the pieces of eight and pick up 
uh, you know, unique equipment or all kinds of neat stuff. Uh, actually, it's Regiments of Renown. So you can use these to unlock the Regiments of Renown. So really neat stuff. And then, like I said, there's standard treasure maps that you'll pick up sometime as well. And it's really fun to go hunt down. So, And then they have rights like every other Warhammer 2 faction that they can use. So pretty good stuff here with the Vampire Coast. Very solid offerings in terms of giving you a lot of unique play style. So that's Luther Harkon. Let's go start loading up the other lords and see if they are the same or if they are different. Count Noctilus and his Dread Fleet. So here they are. They're going to maintain pirate crews and shipbuilding, the Infamy, and Pirate Cove. So nothing different there so far from Luther Harkon. And then as we take a look up here, yep, Infamy still there. Sea Shanty stuff still the same. Um, obedience to the... Oh, these are just special abilities that are enacted. Never mind. Um, he's still got the treasure maps, the pieces of eight. Uh, the rights are pretty much the same. Again, it's just the start position here for Count Noctilus and the buffs. So, again, unfortunate that, you know, sometimes you have very unique mechanics from one lord to the next with others. But, I mean, honestly, these two were the... Uh, were, well, actually, I think all the Vampire Coast Lords... I don't remember if they all launched at the same time or not. I can't I can't remember right now. I should have looked that up, but I didn't. Um, but in any case, the first two here, at least with Noctilus and with Harkon, uh, they are going to be very, very similar uh, in terms of their play style, except that they buff different things. They have slightly different faction mechanics. Uh, or I say faction mechanics. They have slightly different, yeah, faction mechanics because uh, it's not a race thing. They have the same race mechanics, but within their faction, they have certain faction specialties, we'll call it, uh, that they go for. Anyway, that's Harkon. Let's move on to RNS. Pirates of Sartosa. And here they are on the uh, Mortal Empires map at the Sartosa start. Like I said, you can see that you're pretty much ready to immediately begin the invasion of Tylea or taking out Tabaro or Skaven Blight. You can kind of take your pick, Lucini here, um, whatever you want to go after. Sartosa is kind of a fortress, but there is a low water crossing point here, so you can access it via the mainland. So it's not quite as much a fortress as it was on the Vortex map, but still not bad. Um, so let's take a look at Salt Spite. Um, the how they play is exactly the same. Not really surprised. We saw this from time to time with CA where it seems like when a Lord would come in as a unique DLC offering like Ikat Claw, for example, then they would give them very unique, very specific faction mechanics on top of the race mechanics that already existed. And since the coast um, didn't really have that like stuff coming in, we don't see any of them have anything particularly unique, but still, nonetheless, I think that they have good solid mechanics in general that are a lot of fun to play and are pretty much on par or better than other stuff we have seen in Total War Warhammer 2. And that's not going to be any difference for Salt Spite. Again, same mechanics, treasure maps, all that type of stuff. Let's move on and take a look at Silastra and see if that holds out through all of the Lords. The Drowned in their start position here in Lustria with Silastra. You can see the how they play, as I mentioned, will be the same. There's not going to be anything different here. Um, however, Silastra does get buffs like when she's using Sirenes. And of course, the other factions get similar things like Aranessa can, uh, can recruit um, some living units like Free Company Militia and Sartosa Pirates and stuff like that. So they do each have their slight nuances to them that are going to set them apart from the other factions. And for Silostra, it's definitely this ethereal stuff that you see here. And it makes it quite fun. Now, Silostra, in my opinion, has a very hot start here in terms of, um, I mean, you are just going to be in a constant battle. And it's fun. I enjoy it. I played through a Silostra campaign and had a whole lot of fun with it. And it's definitely one that I would recommend if you're looking for a pretty good challenge with the coast. I think she's got a, a pretty uh, challenging start. Anyway, that's her start here. Nothing different. So at this point, it's time for us to go cover the roster. And I will wrap things up by saying I think their campaign mechanics are good. Again, it's a bit sad, like with every other faction, that each Lord can't have their own very unique, specific faction requirements. I don't know if that's something that CA ever intends to add to every faction. If, this, if the Vampire Coast needs something, it would be that. Otherwise, I think they're all pretty good to go and they would be just fine in a Mortal Empires campaign for game three um, because their mechanics are fun and they are unique and they give you a reason to come play them. Now on to the Vampire Coast roster. Let's start with infantry as we always do. The Vampire Coast, as I have mentioned earlier and as you can see by the name, is an undead faction. So all of their units have the crumbling mechanic and as is typical with undead factions like the Tomb Kings or like the Vampire uh, Counts, their units tend to have rather crappy stats, large numbers, 
but the fact that they're unbreakable can help make up for some of the crappy stats. Again, that is a generalized speaking. That doesn't mean that every unit they have is crap. I'm just saying that in a comparable sense, their stats tend to be a little bit lower because they don't route from the battlefield like other factions do. And the Coast has some interesting offerings. As a general rule, I'm going to start this out, the Coast play very defensive. They're very slow and they're not very offensive. There is some exception to this if you decide to take like a Morn Ghoul rush or something. Um, but for the most part, the Coast is very slow and defensive because they rely on their extreme range capability, um, which we will cover here shortly. So keep that in mind as we start to cover the roster. Now, uh, infantry, zombie pirate deckhand mob. Everything about this unit looks like crap, except for the price. And that's what you got to remember about this, uh, this unit is that it is a meat shield. That's what it's meant to be used as. It's just meant to absorb hit points and take up space and slow the enemy down and get them tired. There's an improved version of it, which is the zombie pirate deckhand mob with pole arms. This unit is actually quite good for the price and being able to have a pole arm uh, dealing damage. Yes, their attack's very low. They don't hit very much, but they will bog down large units and cause an inordinate amount of damage to them given their uh, cost level. So these are great for guarding artillery. They're great for helping you form up a defensive box. Um, a very nice base unit uh, for the Vampire Coast. Now we're going to move on to Sirenes, and Sirenes are going to be um, an interesting pick. They are, for the Coast, a very fast-moving unit at 48, and much like Cairn Race with the Vampire Counts, they're an excellent flanker that causes good uh, armor-piercing damage, where you have to be care and they also cause terror, which you need to keep in mind, so it makes them, again, very good at flanking. Now this unit, though, is squishy on its own because it's ethereal, um, I mean, if nothing has magic attacks, it's not going to be real squishy, but um, the leadership is not great on these units. If they get out alone and they're unsupported, they're going to struggle. If they get good leadership support and get into the right engagement, they'll be absolutely deadly, especially early in a campaign where enemy units are not going to have immune to psychology or a lot of the other benefits that would help protect them. Sirenes are a great unit. Just keep them away from magic damage, damage enemies. Uh, Depth Guard are going to be the elite infantry for the coast, and they are quite good. Um, they're very expensive, but Depth Guard pack an absolutely huge wallop in melee, and they make something like the um, the Vampire Count's uh, Grave Guard look like kind of a joke. Now, that said, Grave Guard costs like 500 gold less, so I don't expect them to be exactly in the same uh, playing field. They get Frenzy, which is awesome. Uh, they're restoring hit points when they're in melee. They're a very powerful unit, and they don't do great against armor, but they hit like a truck against unarmored units with 64 melee strength and a whopping 48 melee attack. Uh, they don't have a ton of defense, but this unit is like a lawnmower going through uh, some short dry grass <laughs> whenever they're unarmored. So this is a very good uh, berserker unit here that the the count or the coast gets. Then they get uh, this one too, the death guard with pole arms. So again, cry your heart out, vampire counts. The vampire coast gets pole arms and you do not. <laughs> Um, so if you're looking for elite units to form up a defensive box and to hold out monsters and to take down large units and protect your artillery and guns, well, the Coast definitely has the ability to do that. Um, and the Death Guard with Polearm is a very dangerous unit. Pretty solid melee defense, pretty solid attack, good damage, AP, anti-large, even a decent charge bonus for a Polearm. I mean, really the only downside to this unit is the cost and the fact that it doesn't have a shield is very powerful. Again, Frenzy and hunger. These are excellent elite infantry units, and they give the Vampire Coast a very nice ability to punch at a higher tier when you get later into the campaign. Now, that's not to say that these units will absolutely mow down their competition. They won't, but at least it gives you something on the same tier, in my opinion. Now, let's move on to missile infantry, because this is definitely one of the strengths for the Vampire Coast, starting off with zombi zombie pirate gunnery mob. I pretty much always pick these guys over this one up here on in the infantry. And the reason being is because they have a gun and they can shoot it at short range and the gun is going to cause more damage than they do in melee. So I like the zombie pirate gunnery mob over the uh, zombie pirate deckhand mob. That's just a personal decision for me. Then next up, we got bombers. These guys took a nerf, but they're still extremely effective. You can put the bombers like kind of in, like if you make kind of a checkerboarded formation and put the bombers in the gaps, these guys will annihilate enemy infantry as it comes in, and that is after the nerf. Before the nerf, they were just straight up broken. Um, zombie pirate gunnery mob bombers are an excellent unit to keep at close range behind cheaper mob units and let them do the damage and wear the enemy down by attrition. Fantastic unit in the coast roster. And we have the uh, gunnery mob with handguns. <clears throat> These guys have better range, and they cause significant AP damage from that range. 
very dangerous units. And the thing to remember with them too is that when they get charged by light cavalry, which you will be tempted to do because you don't want them shooting at you, they don't rout. You have to all the way kill them, which makes them extremely difficult to deal with and makes them a little bit better than gunners. Um, and they're cheap, honestly, they're quite cheap. They do lack any armor. They're absolutely gosh awful in melee. But the fact that they don't route makes them a little bit dangerous. This is a very solid unit um, in the coast roster and very useful against large targets and at their price point, very effective. Then we have zombie pirate gunnery mob with hand cannons. Now, I don't use this a ton in multiplayer. Um, however, in campaign, it can be a fun use. Again, if you're doing that kind of checkerboarded formation, you stick these guys in the gaps with their short range. They have extreme missile damage over that short range and they can really mop up blobs pretty decently. Um, and then we go to the deck gunners. Now these guys have a use in both multiplayer and campaign as a mid-range artillery platform that's good against armor. And they can be specifically good against like cavalry and large targets as well. Um, so the deckhand mob is kind of a good mid-range artillery unit, even though it's gonna be in here as infantry. Um, so that's their missile infantry. It's quite good and it gives them a lot of options. The coast loves to shoot. They love to stand off and shoot and their missile infantry definitely shows that. Now, even though they like to stand off and shoot, they still get some pretty decent monsters and beasts as well. So let's cover those, starting with Felbats. Felbats are an excellent fast mover that we would have covered with the Vampire Counts. Um, they're very good for clogging up enemy artillery, um, for bogging down enemy flying units, stopping the charges of enemy cavalry, um, bogging down enemy spellcasters, bogging down enemy artillery. So that's really their use is to get around the battlefield and get in the way and to be a nuisance. And they are quite good at that with their speed. Then we have the Bloated Corpse. The Bloated Corpse is a very unique unit. Um, it, it says like it has weapon strength and stuff here, but it really doesn't. Like it doesn't fight. The minute it touches a melee, it just explodes. So I don't really know what this weapon strength and defense and all that stuff's about. Like the minute it touches combat, um, it just, it explodes. Um, and that's if you click an attack order. Now it'll also explode if it gets shot up by something. It is not good against single entity monsters, but it is really fantastic against high entity blobs. So let's say you have like a blob of infantry or cavalry. It is extremely effective at cleaning it up. The obvious downside being is that it explodes to do so and you lose the unit. So it's like the ultimate kamikaze unit um, in Warhammer 2, but uh, in multiplayer and in campaign, these guys can be very useful in the right situation. Tricky but useful, don't underestimate them. I actually kind of think they might be better in multiplayer than they are in campaign, which is a, uh, you know, a change, but not necessarily. So again, don't discount those guys. Then we get scurvy dogs. This is a grounded option similar to the fell bats, but stronger in melee. Again, don't discount these guys. They have Vanguard deploy, they're very quick, and they can be a real nuisance to enemy light cavalry, enemy skirmishers and other stuff. They look like a cheap unit, and they are, but they are very useful because they give the coast some much, much needed speed. Then we're going to have animated hulks. These guys can back up the terrible infantry line of the coast and help add much needed AP damage. They don't have much armor, and they're, so they're kind of a cheaper monstrous infantry, uh, but they're very good at being able to back up and give some mass and extra armor piercing damage to that kind of cheap and flimsy coast infantry line. Then we get Morn Ghouls. Morn Ghouls are interesting because they're fairly quick for a monstrous infantry and quick in terms of the coast. Once again, they're low armor like most things in the coast are, but they're AP anti-infantry specific and they can vanguard deploy and they also have stock, which makes them difficult to spot early in a battle. And these guys give the coast, again, a much needed um, uh, added depth to their army, whereas the coast would almost always be a noob artillery box that can be totally different with the Morn Ghouls because these guys can pop up anywhere, they can lay ambush attacks, and against the right targets, they are extremely dangerous. And so foes do have to be aware of that Morn Ghoul uh, vanguard attack that can come and you know they can combine in with stuff like scurvy dogs and you really gotta watch out. Uh, then we're gonna get to the Rotting Prometheans, which is a, another monstrous infantry or you know monstrous cavalry, however you wanna look at it. Um, they are a cool unit. They have uh, AP weapon strength, and they're going to be heavily armored. So again, this is a uniqueness to the coast because there's typically not much armor with them. So similar job to the animated hulks, except these guys are gonna be well armored. So if you're looking for a lot more staying power in combat, then it's gonna be the rotting Prometheans. Then we get to the rotting Leviathan, which is the larger cousin of the rotting Prometheans. It is a giant crab who does intense AP and anti-infantry damage, but also has some ranged units up on its back that fire constantly, causes terror, 
Um, it's pretty quick at speed of 50. Um, it's a very large target though, so it's easy to be targeted by enemy infantry. But if you're going up against factions that aren't going to be great at using missile units to bring down a monster like this, or if you're going up against factions that rely on a lot of infantry, say like the Greenskins, this is going to be a deadly weapon and a good weapon for the coast. It is a very powerful single entity monster. And speaking of, we get to the top tier of that and we end up with the Death Shriek Terror Geist, which gives the coast a little bit of flying punch here. It does have poison attacks, 90 speed, 460 weapon strength with AP and a pretty good charge bonus. It does regenerate in combat as well, or sorry, it doesn't have to be in combat, it's just constant, but it makes it weak to fire. Um, so the Death Shriek Terror Geist does get a, uh, sorry, three breath attacks as well. Um, the breath attack's not as powerful as a dragon, but still quite useful at hurting infantry blobs. So a very nice roster of monster and beast for the coast. But they're not done with that because they also have some with missiles. Let's start off with deck droppers. There's three flavors of deck droppers, the standard, the bombers, and the handguns. And as you can imagine from our discussion earlier, the standard deck droppers um, do not have specific AP missile strength, but are just pretty good in general at a short range missile damage. The deck droppers with bombs, again, short range, but higher damage with the bombs because it's like the bomber units on the ground, but these ones are in the air. And then you have the deck droppers with handguns who, like the handguns on the ground, do much better AP missile damage. Uh, these are slightly less um, uh, range than their counterparts on the ground, but still quite good. And they move around with high speed at 80. Deck droppers with handguns in particular are a, a favorite of mine. They're a very nice way to kind of give some added mobility and flanking protection for your artillery box, for instance. So as units try to approach your box or move around it, the deck droppers can be quickly repositioned to shoot them. They can also be sent ahead of your army to harass an enemy and try and pull them forward into your artillery or mid-range artillery range. Um, so deck droppers are useful in all their forms depending on what your need is, but I think deck droppers with handguns are by far the most useful. And then we move up to the Rotting Promethean Gunnery Mob, which we saw the Rotting Prometheans earlier. These are basically the same thing, except they have gunners on their back. They can also cause range damage from relatively short range, and it can be quite powerful in the right situation. They are mounted up high on a mount, which does give them better line of sight than a lot of gunners as well. Again, can be useful. Now onto my favorite missile monster, probably in the entire game, and that's gonna be the Necrofex Colossus. This thing is awesome. It's like combining a, a slightly weaker giant with a cannon. And it is very good at both range and pretty darn decent in melee. The Necrofex Colossus is also a really sweet looking unit, very unique. It's like a walking ship held together by the sinews of all the souls who died within it. It is an insane model that CA came up with and it is really cool and provides a very nice place on the roster uh, for the Vampire Coast. Uh, you can use these sometimes as your artillery. They're slightly shorter range than if you have a grounded artillery, but still provide a huge punch. And remember that Noctilus can be mounted on one. Speaking of artillery, here we are. Now, it may not look that special. You basically get two offerings plus Queen Bess. And I am gonna count Queen Bess as a standard unit, even though technically it's a regiment of renown. Um, but yeah, here we are. So mortars are going to be 380 range, good against infantry. So if you're coming up against a faction that has a lot of archers, like the High Elves, mortars can be quite helpful. Then you got carronades, um, which are going to be better against cavalry, large targets, single entity targets. They do AP damage from range, but they're not horrible against infantry as well, as long as they have a good line of sight. Very long range at 450 and a very reasonable cost at 750. Carronades, in my opinion, are what makes the coast particularly deadly because it means that their range is very good. And then you start mixing that with stuff like the Necrofex Colossus, Deck Gunners, other stuff. It makes them very dangerous from range. Queen Bess, I'll go ahead and address real quick. Um, I don't typically talk through regiments of renown, but let's call this one out. Queen Bess is very long range, and this thing will absolutely decimate infantry units. Just be it known that players, if they're paying attention, can dodge Queen Bess's very slow moving shots very easily. AI is not generally speaking so competent. And so Queen Bess is a very fun artillery unit, mostly for campaign, but does occasionally get good use in multiplayer as well. Um, so it just kind of depends. But that's the Coast roster. As you would expect from Undead, they are weak um, in terms of armor and just generally speaking damage output. There's a few units that do buck that trend. However, as typical with other Undead factions, their monsters and beasts are quite good. It's just that in this Undead faction, I guess a little more similar to the Tomb Kings than the Counts, they're also quite good from range. And so it makes them very deadly 
um, and a, a very tough foe in certain circumstances, uh, especially for certain factions that don't have the right tools for trying to deal with that. Now let's start taking a look at their heroes. From a hero standpoint, we start out with a gunnery white. Typically, people might want to overlook the gunnery white, but the reason why they shouldn't is because of this. Um, hang on right here. Where is it at? Items. Oh, crap. It's none of these. I know it's out here somewhere. Right here. More powder. Um, it doesn't show up on the abilities because it's not one you can choose to leave behind, I don't think. Kind of looks like that one, but it's not. Yeah, so more powder is a special ability that can be used four times to replenish the ammunition of units. So the Gunnery White is decent in a melee, not great. Um, he can be mounted on a crab, like a rotting Promethean, which is kind of like a, a, I say a mini crab, but not exactly like super mini. It's just not as big as a rotting Leviathan. Um, so it does give him AP strength and missile damage if he is on uh, the crab. Um, however, again, the restock ability is what makes the Gunnery White so useful. Plus, he can encourage nearby troops to keep them in the fight. So don't underestimate that Gunnery White. They are very good. Then we get the Morngul Hunter, who is a specific damage dealer hero that you can throw in to be very good against infantry. So use him when you need to break uh, elite enemy infantry, when you need to bust through an enemy line. Uh, he's a great um, vanguard deploy unit that you can throw in there with other Morngul's. Um, to try and help keep their leadership up because you know he's a uh, he doesn't have the specific encourage aura unfortunately but he, he is a unit that's a little bit better leadership than the typical morn ghouls and can go out and help try and keep them in the fight longer i like the uh, the morn ghoul hunter it's a fun hero and then we get several um spell casters for the coast you're going to get uh, vampires death and deep vampires we've seen with lore of vampires and this fleet captain um, honestly is uh, way better in melee than your typical caster. 430 weapon damage, and he's basically a duelist. So don't underestimate vampire fleet captains in a melee. Um, they're not going to blow your mind, but they're kind of strong. And if you put them on the crab, they get even stronger. Um, and then, like I said, they come with the spells that we would expect. The difference being, instead of summoning up a human of zombies, it will summon up deckhand mob, right? So that's what makes it different with the lore of vampires. Uh, death we've seen before, so no need to cover it. And then Deep, I'm not going to cover the melee stats because it's all the same, but from a spell standpoint, Lore of Deep is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is going to be, is it uh, Van Geist Revenge? Yeah, right here. Van Geist Revenge is a really cool spell. It's a wind spell where a giant ethereal boat pops up and just unleashes its carronades all over um, the, the enemy, and it's a really neat spell. But there's some other good spells here too. Uh, Kraken's Pull takes away a ton of speed. And then you've got uh, the ability with Denizens of the Deep to summon a unit of Rotting Prometheans, which is very powerful. Um, and then you've got the Spiteful Shot here, which can buff up a unit temporarily, giving it massive accuracy. Um, and then Tide Call, which is going to slow down units as well and disrupt their formation. So Lore of Deep is a very interesting spell lore that got added for the coast and a very nice one. Now let's take a look at the Lords for the Vampire Coast. First, let's hit all the generics so that we understand them. You're going to have basically... Uh, where you had your vampire fleet captain of vampires death and deep all of those are going to be here too so the difference is is they get a pole arm when they're a lord which makes them specifically good against large so again don't underestimate these vampire uh heroes they're quite decent in melee so here is death deep vampires but this one has a pistol so there's a pistol and a pole arm variant so the pistol variants are kind of like a, a dollar store luther the pole arm variants are kind of like a dollar store um what you call it a uh, noctilus okay so there's quite a few options here, and you know you, you get some of each, uh, or two of each. So here's Fleet uh, fleet Admiral, Lore of Vampires with Polearm, Polearm of Death, um, Polearm Deep, and then you get your Pistol Vampire, Pistol Death, and Pistol Deep. So six generic Lords, each bringing their own specific value. This is really good. It gives the Vampire Coast quite a few options. Now let's hit those Legendary Lords. So Arnes Assault Spite, She's an AP anti-large tool. She doesn't have access to any mounts, but she does move around the battlefield at pretty quick at a speed of 44. She does also have the Fisherman's or Spearfisher's Net, which can take away melee defense and lock down an enemy unit, um, which makes her pretty useful. She's not a super common pick. She is immune to psychology, which is helpful. She's also not undead, which means she can't be healed by the um, vampire spell invocation of the hack. Um, so it makes her a little different in that regard. You have to be careful with her because she's not an undead unit. Um, she's low armor, but she causes high damage, and she's a pretty decent duelist. So that's her stick. And then we got Luther Harkon up next. Luther has a monstrous mount available and a Death Streak Terror Guys, which makes him a pretty formidable melee combatant. He also has a gun that is quite powerful from short range. If you can keep him parked next to an enemy lord or monster, 
He can cause a lot of damage to it over time. He does have this disrupted thing, which hurts miscast chance and physical resistance whenever he's hitting with his pistol or his weapon, which kind of shows him imbuing his insanity onto whatever it is that he's attacking. Um, and as far as um, he doesn't do spells, so he's not a spellcaster. He's a melee hero, and he has this slan gold thing here, too, which will reduce enemy recharge rate. Um, pretty cool unit. He also has horn swoggle, which is a very popular thing to be used in multiplayer. It's also quite good in campaign. It's a nice debuff. And then you've got this power siphon, which again is going to be something similar, a nice debuff against enemy units. Um, he replenishes with the hunger as well. So it makes him a good melee combatant with short range missile capabilities. Then we've got Silostra Direfin here. She is a spellcaster for Lore of Deep, has a rotting Leviathan mount, should you choose to take it. She is ethereal, so she's heavily relying on physical resistance. Be extremely careful not to pick Silostra when you think you're coming up against a faction multiplayer, for instance, that has a lot of magic attacks because she will melt to it. Um, but when she is on her um, crab, it does change. She's not really ethereal on the crab, so just be aware of that. She still does have some physical resistance, but it changes her significantly. So if you take her without the mount, be careful of magic damage, magic missiles, that kind of stuff. She'd be very vulnerable to it. Uh, but Silostra is a lot of fun if you're looking for a, um, a combatant to just, you know, give you something more interesting. An ethereal spellcaster is something we didn't have in the game prior to that. And um, she can use Van Geist Revenge and the summoning of the crabs um, to do a lot of damage. So she's a fun lord to play. And then Count Noctilus, who I think is probably my go-to with the coast. Um, Noctilus is very, very tough in melee without a mount. He's very difficult to take down. He heals. He has a lore of vampires uh, mixed with shadows. Um, so it makes him pretty unique in that. He gets a Wind of Death spell, Invocation to Hack, a Summon. Then he also picks up the Pit of Shades, which is powerful, Withering, and Melkoth's Miasma, which hurts, you know, both hit points and speed. Uh, with his Necrofex Colossus mount, it turns him into a ranged artillery piece, um, as well as a good melee combatant, as well as a spellcaster, which makes him, again, particularly potent um, when he's up there. So he's good in both um, campaign and multiplayer, in my opinion. It has a lot of benefits. This Wraith Storm Bombardment is also really good at causing damages, uh, both to single entities and to, to units. It's a nice bombardment that has long range and again, makes Noctilus very, very dangerous. Um, and then he's got this Captain's Roth Moondial here, or Captain Roth's Moondial um, that was summons additional um, uh, zombies. So it makes it again, very difficult to get in there and kill Noctilus because he's constantly surrounded by deckhand mob. Um, so anyway, yeah, he's a lot of fun. Probably, in my opinion, the best lord for the coast. So, there you have it. The Vampire Coast summarized. Let's go through it real quick. They have good campaign start positions. They have fun campaign mechanics. Probably ready for game three. Again, if we're going to add anything, it really would just be a unique faction mechanic for each lord. They have unique faction uh, traits and stuff already. That's something CA has already added. When I say mechanic, I'm talking about like... Queek Headtaker versus Ica Claw, right? Ica Claw has the laboratory, Queek does not. So that's what I'm getting at when I go. So if CA adds that, great. It would make the coast absolutely great. But from a, a campaign start position mechanics, these guys are great. They're ready for game three. They're a lot of fun. They're totally ready to be in that game. From a roster standpoint, I think the Vampire Coast is in a good place. Um, they are probably not like the top tier in multiplayer, but they're competitive when used right. Um, they're quite good in campaign. In fact, they're quite powerful when used against the enemy right because of all their missile units and magic. So they're totally capable. From a roster standpoint, they're in good shape. Could more be added to them? Well, that's a good question. The Vampire Coast is kind of made up, right? They open the door for stuff like Cathay and Kislev to come around. And basically, we saw at this point that Games Workshop liked um, Creative Assembly so much that they were willing to let them basically flesh out and create more factions. Yes, I know the Coast was mentioned, and they may have even had a few units. I don't remember all the specifics about how Coast fit into the old Warhammer fantasy battles, but I know that CA was given, like, Silostra did not exist, for instance, in the old Warhammer fantasy battles. And again, kind of opened the door for the idea that, that CA could work with Games Workshop to, like, put new content into the old fantasy battle stuff, which is pretty amazing, um, and I really like it. Now, the only thing that I think could have really made the Coast unbelievable and I've already mentioned it, was the fact that they could have added the Dreadfleet IP. But that's a big ass. That's a whole lot of models, art, animations, totally changes the game. So I get why it didn't happen, but man, I wish it did. 
would have been absolutely epic. But Vampire Coast, are they ready for game three? Yes, they are. Fun factions, and folks, that's gonna round it out. There we go. We looked at the state of the faction for every faction from Warhammer 1 and 2. I have them all in the playlist. You can check it all out. You can watch it and review for yourself. I enjoyed making these. Thank you for all the support. They got a lot of views. People seem to really enjoy it. What other ideas do you have for, you know, shows that you'd like to see me make? And I'll take some of those ideas, but I'm also thinking of some as well. And I'll try and keep making content that you all both find entertaining and useful. Anyway, Air of Carthage signing out from the State of the Faction series, and I will be back soon with some more content.